preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I applaud your hardihood, uh, and I hope you, that your endurance will be equal to it. Uh, some of you must have the program laid out for these four lectures, and I want to advise you in advance that I shall not uh, stay strictly within the limits of the lectures here, because there's too much material, and I can only handle it by overlapping here and there. But on the whole, I will follow the scheme which I drew up some months ago when I began to prepare the material. And I will, of course, begin with some observations on the origins and the character of Yiddish. First, as to its character, really, its uh, peculiarity as a language. In spirit, uh, Yiddish is neither European nor Oriental. It's a mingling of the two. And it's a uh, physical similarity to the extent of, say, 90% to certain Germanic origins is not a clue to the spirit of the language. A language reflects the history, the experience of a people. You might say that a language is really the frozen history of a people. And if you examine a language and go into the layers which have accumulated in the language, you'll go deeper and deeper into the experience of the people. Now, Yiddish is the language of a people which, while living in Europe and while taking most of the raw material of the language, namely the syllables, as it were, from surrounding peoples, was living to a large extent in its own imagination in the past. And there is consequently a peculiarity in the Yiddish language which makes its translation into the Germanic languages all the harder precisely because of the Germanic material which it contains. I want to warn some of you, I'm sure that uh, most of you don't need the warning, I want to warn some of you against the feeling which still exists in various places that Yiddish is a corrupted German. I'm sure that I say most of you uh, don't uh, subscribe to or don't sympathize with that point of view. Uh, but you've heard it said that Yiddish is a corrupted German. Now, one language which is derived to some extent from another is no more a corruption of that language than any language in the world, because all languages, as far as our knowledge of languages is concerned, all languages are derived from other languages. You don't call French a corrupted language, a corruption of Latin, because Eme is taken from Amare, or you don't call... Italian, uh, a corrupted language because the word assoluto is taken from the Latin absolute and so on. As a matter of fact, one could just easily say that uh, some d Jews do, also wrongly, that German is a corrupted Yiddish because there are words in German, or rather there are words missing in German which went over to the Yiddish, were dropped by the German and have remained in Yiddish. For example, the word sheer, meaning almost. Uh, those of you who know Yiddish will recognize the sentence, er is sheer gestorben, he nearly died. Well, the word sheer there is pure old German, which has remained in Yiddish and has disappeared from the German. Or the word schnur, 
or some Yiddish dialects say Schneer, meaning a daughter-in-law, has disappeared from the German, replaced by the word Schwiegertochter, and has remained in the Yiddish. But, of course, that's uh, more or less of a um, jocular remark that uh, some people believe German to be a corrupt Yiddish. The ones who used to say, the Deutschens are not fine folk, not the Sloshen Herget say weg. Now, we recognize that approximately nine-tenths of the words we use in Yiddish are Germanic in origin. Various German dialects from the Lower Rhine Kop in Yiddish is not a corruption of Kopf. It is simply the way the word Kopf developed among the Yudas of Yiddish, just as Stub for Stube developed into that form in the Yiddish language. And even certain varieties have their own meaning, for example, or their own justification. For example, in Warsaw, uh, somebody will say Enktisch, meaning your table, deriving from Euer Tisch, which is used in parts of Germany, Yiddish having been derived from several of the Germanic dialects, and this does not bespeak a corruption of the language, but a development into a new language. So certain grammatical forms developed quite naturally in the intramural use of the language among Jews, that intramural use being encouraged by the fact that they also admitted a certain percentage of Hebrew words and speaking among themselves uh, would develop specific characteristics which they might withhold when they were speaking outside. Now, you know that many people in modern countries speak two varieties of the same language. You will hear in England, for example, a Lancashire man speaking the Lancashire dialect, the North Country dialect, when he is among his own. And when he goes elsewhere, perhaps to London, he won't speak with a Cockney accent, but he will speak another language. <laughs> you have in America today people who speak two languages. They will speak the popular vulgar language when they're among themselves. And by vulgar, I don't mean coarse. I mean what vulgus means, namely the people. And when they are formal, they will speak the grammatical language correctly. Sometimes they overdo it. Now, in the same way, among Jews originally, there was no doubt a duality of language. When they were among themselves, they would speak it in one way. When they went out in the surrounding world to do business with various peoples, they would use the other form. And among themselves, they developed more and more their particular forms. For example, they would drop the umlaut. We have no umlaut in Yiddish, you know, the U sound. Like uh, grün in German would become green in Yiddish. Böse in German would become bez in Yiddish. The A would change to an O. The Ja would change to a J. Yaren would change to Jorn. And then there would be interconnections of influence. <clears throat> For example, they would take a German word, König, meaning a king, and they would pronounce it König. But then they would use the word with a Hebrew grammatical form. In Hebrew, you have the word Melech, king, and Malach, he reigned. So they invented the word Kinnigan, to reign, which doesn't exist in German. Now, Kinnigan is the equivalent to lord it over somebody, to reign over somebody. I'm just giving you little instances of how the Yiddish language developed among these people while they conversed among themselves. Later on, of course, there came words from the outside, from the Slavic, a word like lopeta, meaning a, uh, a spade, or a capota from the French 
meaning, as you know, a gown or a bub, from the Slavic meaning a grandmother, and whole phrases would be taken over. But what's very interesting about Old Yiddish is that some of the very oldest words are not Germanic at all. Of course, the very oldest are Hebrew, that might be called properly Yiddish. But some of the words are not Germanic at all, but Latin, showing that people who came from the south, from Romance-speaking countries, Spain and Italy, brought to the north these words, which became incorporated in Yiddish and are among the oldest. For example, the word benchen, you know, to uh, say the benediction. Well, there's the origin of the word. Benediction and benchen are of the same origin. Or cholent, connected with the French word chaud, and still more closely with the French word chaleur, meaning heat. Now, as I suppose you all know, cholent is the food, the meal, the dish, specially prepared on Friday and kept hot, that is to say, with chaleur, kept with heat in, until the next day. And certain names go back to, which are supposed to be intimately and aboriginally Yiddish, go back not to the Germanic, but again to the Romance languages. For example, Fivish. That's a very Yiddish name. Originally Phoebus, Phoebus Apollo. Or the name Sprinze, a very Yiddish name for a girl, from Esperanza. Now, it's a very far cry from Esperanza to Sprinze. And one, can't, one really can't associate the two uh, Esperanza makes you think of uh, uh, balmy southern nights and guitars on the windows, and Sprinzer makes you think, well, our Sprinzer, Jewish girl with a rather pointed nose and a cheerful face running down the village street with a basket on her hand, Hotgate Sprinzer. And that that should be Esperanza is very strange indeed, just as it's strange to think that Schneer, such a Yiddish name, is really from the Spanish and senior and its cognate word in Italian. Of course, there were words that came in from other language, from Romance languages later, which are not to be confused with these early specimens. For example, maler. Now, many of you know in Yiddish, you say a maler. Now, the word maler, which is the French malheur, a misfortune, doesn't occur in Yiddish of 200 years ago. It only came in about 150 years ago, when the soldiers of the French army invading Russia under Napoleon, the famous uh, invasion, were scattered among the villages and brought French words into the villages among Jewish homes. For example, you will find among locutions in Yiddish a phrase like Lignisch dorten via Schwal which is the French word for a horse, cheval, brought in at the same time under the influence of the Napoleonic invasion of Russia. Now, as I said, these are simply little indications of how the language began to form separately and drew upon various elements, the dominant element being the German physically, Nevertheless, the dominant element emotionally and spiritually was the internal cultural being of the Jewish people, based upon the Torah, based upon the Siddur, based upon the festivals, based upon all the traditions. So the language which emerged was a very strange mixture, which I say cannot be identified either as a strictly European, except as the physical structure, or as a strictly Oriental, except as to the basic concepts which were brought from the Near East, but is a language sui generis. It is a very remarkable and fascinating language uh, of a particular kind. Then you have in Yiddish a species of dualism, which survives to some extent in English for a similar reason, but in a weaker form. 
You know how one says in English, in legal documents, to aid and abet, to hinder and to hamper. Now that arose from the circumstance that early English was a mixture of Norman French and Anglo-Saxon. And when they were drawing up formal documents, they used both languages so as to be sure of being intelligible both to the native Anglo-Saxon population in England and to the newcomers, the invaders of England, namely the French Normans. And thus you have, you remember I told you that a language is the frozen history of a people. Thus you have frozen into the English language the evidences of the conquest of England by the Norman French. So you have frozen into the Yiddish language the evidences of the junction between this Germanic physical base and this oriental spirit in a parallelism of terms. And a good Jew, meaning one who is familiar with Yiddish, will often use two words superfluously. He will say, asofanek. They both mean the same thing, but for emphasis he will say it in both languages, asof being the Hebrew, and ek is the Germanic form. Or he will say, ayelola agevein. To gevein, ayelola agevein. There was a lamentation. Now, you can't repeat it in English because you haven't got in English this ditology or parallelism that you have in uh, Yiddish. Or asimcha afraid. You can't repeat that because simcha is the Hebrew form of the word, freid is the Germanic, foide. And uh, so in translation, all of this lovely duality is necessarily lost. Of course, where you have it most, say, in an intimate folk writer like Shalom Aleichem, the task of translating is practically hopeless. What you get is uh, very considerable, and yet it's only a fragment of the charm of the original. So you have parallel phrases all through in the Yiddish. Venixens, you say, le kolapochus. Le kolapachot is pure Hebrew, but we say le kolapochus. Or umfang, meaning the volume of a thing, or the area, the hekif. Azamin sort mensch, azamin min mensch, azamin mensch. Sort and mean. Zoll, number from the German zahl, and kamus, from the Hebrew kamut. And so you'll get very curious phrases in Yiddish. Take a phrase like this. Ravoisai lomir benchen. Ravoisai is, of course, pure Hebrew, rabotai. Lomir lasnvir is Germanic. Benchen is Latin. You've got three words uh, drawn from three languages making pure Yiddish. Or you have a phrase like, Good Shabbos, madame. Gut is Germanic, Shabbos is of course Shabbat, and Madame, as you know, is the German. Now, this gives a very peculiar warmth to the language, which I say is intranslatable, and also gives it the means of conveying back and forth from what I might call the pagan element to the Jewish, and from the Jewish to the pagan, uh, with a suppleness that uh, I don't find in any other language that I am acquainted with. And then, of course, there are certain things that you are already familiar with, I'm sure, that I should only refer to, that Jewish life was lived to a very large extent emotionally and intellectually instead of physically. That is to say, by the 10th century, when Yiddish began to crystallize, the Jews were being driven off the soil there were few Yiddish far Jewish farmers, uh, fishermen, huntsmen, soldiers, sailors, men in government, of course, uh, no Jews in the church, so that the Yiddish vocabulary was restricted and shows considerable poverty in nature terms as compared with other European languages, but shows a corresponding richness in intellectual terms that you don't find in other folk languages of Europe. <clears throat> For instance, you can say in Yiddish, uh, 
You have a variety of terms for learning. Uh, a learner, a kenner, a guter kenner, a Talmud Chochem. You, you haven't got in the folk language of English corresponding terms. You would have to use the rather stilted terms of the academies. Just as in Yiddish, for example, uh, I'm afraid this will uh, appeal only to some of you who know Yiddish very well. Uh, you say in Yiddish, in popular, popular Yiddish, a blat gemora, a perik mishnayis, a kapitel tilim, and you know exactly which word to use. In other words, the folk itself had a tinge of learning in it such as you didn't find among other peoples. And the language was drenched with the nostalgia of the East and with the prayerfulness of the Jew, the longing for the return and the dream of the Messiah and of the restitution of the Jewish people to its ancient glory. I'm afraid that's all I'm going to say to you about the origins and character of Yiddish, although I ought to spend at least five or six evenings in developing the details. I'm going to pass on immediately to the question of how old is the oldest Yiddish literary work that we know of. You'll probably be surprised to hear that a manuscript discovered as late as 1953 is a Yiddish epic poem written nearly 600 years ago. Now, you must bear in mind that Yiddish was a despised language among scholars. It was the language of Amch, or the language of the people. It was, uh, at the beginning, they called it a jargon. Uh, it was the language used in ordinary discourse, and any man with pretensions to culture would write Hebrew, although he would speak Yiddish. There again you have the difference between the spoken and the formal language. So that if by 9, 8, 1382, the year 5143, the date of this manuscript, you already have an epic poem of 42 pages telling of Moses and Abraham and David and the fable of a dying lion, then you may be quite certain that the language had been developing for at least a number of generations and perhaps even for a couple of centuries. There is no doubt about it that vast quantities of Yiddish documents, Yiddish books before the time of, uh, before the uh, age of printing had arrived, uh, got lost. Uh, nobody thought of keeping them. They were not precious. They were only to be used. And you discover very early, in fact, again in the 1380s, a certain Yehuda Achasid wrote down a prohibition in Hebrew as follows. The Cain al Yikase et Sifro Beklafim Hakatuvim Bahem Romance. You must not take a sacred book and use as its covers covers which had been used for a book of romance. In other words, as far back as the 1300s, it was already a widespread custom to read romances in Yiddish, and there were some people who were careless enough or blasphemous enough to take these covers to use them for the purpose of covering a sacred book. And that was forbidden in this document of Yehuda HaChasid. Now, I want you to imagine the life of the Jews of Europe in the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. We know there were great pogroms, especially in the time of the uh, Crusades. We know from the Shevet Yehuda and the Emek Abacha, how thousands of Jews were slaughtered by the Crusaders on their way to the liberation of the Holy Land. 
But you must understand that if the Jewish people survived and developed a language, and the language such a rich and flexible one, it must also have lived a very rich life. And in spite of these frequent assaults from the outside, and in spite of the predominating attitude of scorn or of disdain toward the Jew, there were many interchanges. The Jew of the Middle Ages, living in a compact group, absorbed from the surrounding world many things which he incorporated in his own life. In the Middle Ages, we hadn't, the world hadn't the amusement that we have today. The only form of uh, diversion that would exist would be men going round troubadours and trouvères and minisingers, acrobats and performers going round among the people in the villages, in the marketplaces, and Jews would see that. And Jews would also hear the stories that were told by these minstrels, and there would arise Jewish minstrels, Jewish tellers of stories. Only this is what happened, that when these stories were taken over from the non-Jews, and those stories were very lively, and very often very gross and very coarse, in addition, they were also mingled with religion in that curious way of the Middle Ages. Those of you who are familiar at least with Chaucer, who is already the high Middle Ages, who remember that bawdy stories are mingled together with pious stories and that uh, sexual grossness is next door to the highest nun-like purity there was an earthiness about the Middle Ages which was reflected in these stories of the minisinger, of the balladeers, of the vagantes, of the wandering minstrels. And when the Jews took them over, they tended to cleanse them. They couldn't do without them. They wanted also to participate in the life of the surrounding world, but they could not make use of them in the form in which the surrounding world used them. And so there began finally a sort of shame-faced adaptation of the Goy stories into Yiddish. And at the same time, the religious people who were against this kind of indulgence tried to counteract it first by insisting that Hebrew should be the language of instruction. And if it was going to be Yiddish, then it should be a Yiddish translation of the sacred books. So you got very early translations of the sacred books into Yiddish. We haven't uh, kept the very earliest ones. We don't know when they appeared. All these things were subject to chance and to destruction. But there have remained, not from the very earliest times, not from the 1300s, but from the 1500s, and the 1600s, there remained stories which have come down to our time. There were, for example, stories which were current among the English, among the Italians. Stories, deeds of daring do, of knights in armor, battles between uh, the knights, and battles with demons, and battles with... Uh, wild beasts in the forests and uh, witches, all of it mixed with uh, goyish customs, with goyish meals of pork and uh, other forbidden food. And when the Jews took these over, they substituted chicken for pork, uh, they omitted the mentions of Jesus, and they Yiddishized the story. Now, some of these stories were very famous and uh, were known for centuries. There was a story of Dietrich von Bern, a German king of the 5th century, uh, who goes back to even somebody 
earlier, somebody called Theodore of Verona. And you find among rabbis the injunctions to Jews, one particularly amusing one here that I'll quote. One rabbi wrote, Ich mein, as es is lieb dem allmächtigen Gott, wenn mich schreibt, dass solche Teitschbücher was seinen Helig in Nitzlich, aber nicht Dietrich von Bern und Hildebrand. In other words, not about these goyish figures, these murderers, and what is perhaps worst of all, these eaters of pork. But instead, let us have translations of the Hebrew sacred books. Another favorite figure in the uh, stories that the Jews heard from among their own Jewish troubadours, as it were, was King Arthur, but they changed his name to Artus. And there was a whole series of stories of Der Artus Hoif, or Hof, the court of King Arthur. And it was very popular. There used to be a phrase, some of you may be acquainted with the Yiddish phrase, er lebt wie Gott in Frankreich. I don't know how the phrase arose. Uh, a, a very easy and indulgent life, or a very uh, um, opulent life, or sometimes they say, wie Gott in Odessa. Well, they used to say, wie Gott in Artus Hof. That was the acme of uh, luxury. And... Uh, the stories went around, except there was the difficulties in Yiddish. Since the Jews didn't have knighthood, didn't fight in the lists, didn't know all about the various stratagems of war and of battle and of personal combat, there was great difficulty with words like mace, halberd, Falchion, sword, saber, scimitar, rapier, blade, stiletto, foil, bill, partisan. These were familiar to the folk of other peoples. But in Yiddish you didn't have them, people didn't use them. So they had one, just one or two words to do for all of them. Ashwerd was good enough for every one of them. Now, there would be a typical story of a certain gabine. The Gabine story in Artus Hof. It's the usual artless story told how one day at the court things were rather dull, no new thing had happened, no deed of daring do had been performed, and suddenly there appeared a stranger at the wall of the city or of the court with a girdle for Queen Guinevere, a golden girdle, and a council was held should a golden girdle be accepted for the queen from a stranger, or shouldn't it? And they decided, no, it shouldn't. It would be uh, infra dig, and the person who had offered the insult should be challenged to combat. So somebody went out and fought him, and was taken prisoner, and was led away, and met a princess, and had a son, and left her. And uh, when she asked him, what shall I call our son? He said, Vidu Wilt. And so he was called, meaning, as you want. So there arose the character Vidu Wilt, all these stories appeared in Yiddish just as they appeared in the various Romans de la Rose or in the Charlemagne cycle of uh, Roland and Oliver, the stories of the Knights of the Middle Ages. And one story in particular took hold of the Jewish imagination that you've all heard about and perhaps in a rather disguised, unrecognized form. There was a famous character in legend who in English was known as Bevis of Hampton and who was uh, translated into Italian as Buvo of Antona or Buvo d'Antona. And this was translated into Yiddish by a very celebrated figure, some of you have heard of him, somebody called Eliyahu Bachur. His full name was Eliyahu ben Asher Halevi Hashkenazi. Sometimes he was known as Eliyahu Levita, and as I said, Eliyahu 
Bachur. He was born in southern Germany around 1470, lived to the ripe old age of 84, and was a considerable Hebrew scholar. He taught Hebrew to Gentiles. He was the favorite of a certain cardinal. Those were the days in Italy, you know, when Hebrew was being taken up just like Greek. This was the high Renaissance. But in addition, he also wrote Yiddish. He said at one time, I've written so much in Hebrew, I ought to do something for the ignorant masses and for the women. And then he translated into Yiddish the stories of Buvo Dantona. Those were called the Buvomyces ultimately became known as the Bobomysis. And the word has no connection with Boba, meaning a grandmother. The word simply became assimilated to the word Boba, and people think it has to do with a grandmother. It has to do with Buvo of Antona, who was originally the Englishman Bevis of Hampton. Uh, very strange to imagine these uh, metamorphoses, these Gilgulim of the English Bevis, the knight, the noble knight Bevis of Hampton becomes the Bobamiser in some Yiddish village, some Yiddish shtetl, and nobody knows where he came from. He migrated from England into a shtetl in Russia, and only scholars know, and I've at last made familiar the fact, that this was the origin of the story. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you something about that, because it tells you what Jews were concerned with by way of popular amusement. This Bevis of Hampton, or Buvo d'Antona, it doesn't matter what you call him, uh, we'll take him in his uh, Italian incarnation, was born to an old father and a young mother in Antona. Why Antona? Because it resembles the town, ha in name, the town Hampton of uh, England. Uh, the mother gets the father killed, and the boy Buvo flees, and after adventures he reaches Flanders as a beggar. There the king's daughter falls in love with him, naturally, and they have adventures and wanderings and fights, forests, wild beasts, coincidences. And then the princess Druzana is her name, flees again for him. There are more adventures. And Buvo must uh, leave her, goes away. He returns as a beggar. She doesn't recognize him. You know, all these uh, familiar medieval inventions. But what is interesting is the way it is told in a Yiddishized form. I'm going to give it to you first in the Yiddish of that time. Then I'll give you the English for those of you who don't know Yiddish. It begins, first of all, with a very pious exhortation, which has nothing to do with the story. Gott, den soll man ewig loben, und seine Wunder soll man kunden. Denn er ist geachtet und gehoben in frommen Leitens Munden. Er ist gewaltig unten und oben, sein Lob ist nicht zu gründen. Kein Mensch, der es kann vollenden, wenn es, not, wenn es, wenn es hat noch drum noch enden, which means... Let God be ever praised and his miracles all told when he is respected and exalted in the mouth of pious people. He is ruler below and above. His praise cannot be fathomed. No man can ever complete it, for it has neither limit nor end. Notice, of course, no mention of Christianity, of uh, Jesus, of nuns, of monks, with which the other story is naturally very full. And then in the middle, while he's telling this story about how the uh, queen had the king murdered and so on, he breaks into, a, into the following Yiddish. The river, my Herren, liebe Herren, get a cook, was for an umblick es kommt von schlechte Freuen. Dear people, see what misfortunes can come from bad women. See what King Solomon says. All his life he looked for a good woman and didn't find her. That doesn't occur at all in the in the original story, he felt that he owed this to his uh, Yiddish audience. Or, for instance, when the princess, 
sees her lost uh, husband. He returns after long wandering, dressed as a beggar. She breaks out as follows. Dos beis gesicht als gleichen soll den edlen Herren dem seinem. Oi wei am Mabdel ben koidisch lochoil zwischen seinem lieben Ponem and deinem. All of you know, Amabdel ben Kodesh Lachol comes from the uh, Sabbath Abdullah, the valedictory of the Sabbath evening. And to put this in the mouth of the uh, Flemish princess didn't seem to them to be at all incongruous. Or, for example, the daughter complains to her father that the children haven't been circumcised. And the father says, Nid sorgen, a hipsche bris miele will ich machen morgen. Do not sorrow, we'll have a wonderful bris tomorrow. And he does. Then finally, it winds up in the following charming verses. Und God soll uns der Lesen von unseren Pein und soll uns die Gnade geben, dass wir alle müssen solche sein, Meschirs Zeit zu der Leben. Der soll uns fieren, in Jerusalem hinein oder irgends in ein Städtel daneben. Und soll uns das Beis, das Beis am Mikdash wieder beuen, wir können je herzuhen um ihn treuen. Now, that is the king of Belgium, or the king of the Flemings, who says, so may God redeem us from our suffering and grant us the grace that we may all be privileged to see the Messiah in our lifetime, and he will lead us into Jerusalem or somewhere into a nearby village. He wasn't too particular. The vicinity would do. And we'll rebuild the temple for us, so be it God's will. Amen, amen. So that's how the story is made kosher. And uh, Jews were able to enjoy it, still with certain guilt, because the rabbis frowned upon these worldly stories. And I say repeatedly, the rabbis, if they had to yield to the Yiddish, they would insist upon sacred books. So there arose, as I told you, parallel with these goyish stories, with these uh, impermissible heathen indulgences, there arose also sacred stories told in Yiddish. One of the earliest was called the Shmuel Buch. Probably arose as early as the 14th century, we really don't know. But it's very early. Anyhow, the first printed edition is known to have been issued in 1544 in Augsburg, in Germany. And it's the rhymed story of Samuel, Saul, and David, with some variations, with some of the Midrashim included, and with some dramatizations. It was, as I tell you, half-countenanced. It was uh, yielding to an evil in order that a greater evil might not come to pass, namely that the people should be completely absorbed in the uh, heathen stories of the surrounding uh, folk. So the first one begins like this. Here's an example of the verse. And by the way, it's not bad verse. It's rather doggerel, yet at the same time it has a certain neatness. Nun saß in selben Zeiten very Germanic Yiddish still, nun saß in selben Zeiten zu Rama in der Stadt ein Mann, der hieß Elkanah, der macht die Armen satt. Der selbig Mann, El, der selbig Mann Elkanah hat zu seinem Leib Chana und Penina genommen zu zwei Weib, which I've rendered as follows. At that same time they lived at Rama in the city, a man by name Elkanah, who fed the poor for pity. This same man, this Elkanah, had bound himself for life to Hannah and Penina, and each one was his wife. And so the poem goes on to tell of uh, the adventures of uh, King Saul and of King David, all in this rhymed form, and the book was very popular, not as popular, I'm afraid, as the Buvomyces and the stories of the giants and the uh, wild animals and the uh, knights, but it was a very popular book and was issued and reissued. There was also 
the Tchinus, uh, the Tsena Orena. I think some of you are familiar with it. Tsena Orena, as you know, means go forth and see. It is addressed in the feminine plural to listeners. Go forth and see what uh, there is to learn. And it is the Yiddish, uh, the Yiddish uh, form of biblical narrative mixed also again with many uh, midrashim and uh, many commentaries. <coughs> the Spielman was the Jewish equivalent of the troubadour among the uh, Goyim, and he would come round and Jewish women would also learn to read. You would get a book in which the Hebrew and the Yiddish would be mingled. A Mizmor Asaf El Elohim and a Gesang to Asaf Der Gewaltiker. Uh, a song of Asaf. God the ruler, the powerful, who called out, There shall be earth from the rising of the sun to its downgoing. Then you would get stories which are merely edifying which don't come from the Midrashim, which were made up. I have to skip a great many of them. I have a wealth of material which I will not be able to include in four brief lectures. But uh, here is an instance of a charming story. We are told that a Jew was standing in prayer when a great official of the state passed by and greeted him, and the Jew didn't answer. And the Gentile went on and returned in a great rage and said, Why didn't you answer me? Do you know that you forfeited your life and that you have sinned against God because you forfeited your life? And the man replied, Let me explain to you. Suppose you were standing before a great ruler. <coughs> Let me give it to you in the primitive Yiddish. Wenn du wolltest gestanden für ein größten Herr, was heint is er da on morgen, is er in Keber, was du also mehr gehabt wie ich. Ich, was ihr bin gestanden vor dem Malchus, was er ist ein Malchus über alle Malochen, was er lebt ewig und hat ein Kium auf ewig, ist schon ein Kohl Schochen, als ich hab gedarft mehr haben, vor dir entfernt Scholem. That is to say, since I was addressing God, I was in converse with God, how could I break up break off conversation with him in order to acknowledge your salutation. And uh, so on the spot, the high officer in this particular story was mollified and the pious man proceeded to his home in peace. Now, I'm going to tell you of one more figure uh, that many of you are familiar with before I close this lecture, leaving open a little time for questions. A very important figure that you are familiar with, but I must include in this survey, and that is the woman Gluckel von Hameln. I'm sure that many of you have heard of her. She has produced one of the most important Yiddish books, not important in a literary sense, but important in the history of the language and in the history of the people. Uh, she was born in Hamburg in 1640, and she died in Metz in Alsace-Lorraine in 1724. That is to say, she lived to the ripe old age of 84. She was married twice, the first time at the age of 14. She had six sons and six daughters, all brought up carefully. She had known alternations of wealth and poverty. She had known expulsions. She was a good businesswoman, but uh, often she was poor and she remade her fortunes. She had a good Heder education, and in her latter years, she wrote a remarkable diary and story of her life for the education and edification of her children. Now, this diary of Glickel von Hameln is a classic of pietistic Yiddish. The style is already between that of the Middle Ages and the, I would say, primitive modern, because modern Yiddish as we know it now as it's written today is not more than 60 or 70 or 80 years old. 
but the beginnings of modern Yiddish are about 150 years old. And this book, Glickel von Hamel, is already halfway between the medieval Yiddish I wrote to you, I read out to you before, and the beginnings of modern Yiddish. This is how she begins her diary in a mixture of Hebrew and Yiddish. Call Masha Bara Akadosh Baruchu Lo Bara Alelech Vodo. Mir wissen, dass Hamokum Baruch Hashem und Baruch Shemo. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, this writing is not very clear. Uh, hat mit uh, hat mit a tale von sein Chesed und Rachmen und uh, uh, hat nicht nötig eine von de, von seine Bashefinischen. We know that God, blessed be He and blessed be His name, created all only for His glory and with mercy and grace, because He does not need a single one of His creatures. Also, also far mein ich wertes sich am besten schicken, dass ihr solches von mein Geburt anfang. Mein Geburt, meine ich, ist gewesen, beschnaß tof sein, bekoll a Kodisch Hamburg. As for me, it would be best to begin with my birth. I was born in the holy Jewish community of Hamburg in the year 5407, which is 1740. Dass mich mein koschere, fromme Mutter zu der Welt gebracht hat, mit Hilfe von dem Barmherzigen, dem größten Gott. It's full of these pious phrases. You can imagine this old Jewish Bobby uh, with her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, telling this story almost in the chant that some of us have heard from our grandmothers or great-grandmothers. The material itself is commonplace, but the style is important as leading, as I told you, from the primitive Yiddish are from the rather from the medieval Yiddish to the primitive. Here we have the passage, <coughs> 1700, 1720, 1730, to the time of the Hasidim. Now I'm going to speak to you next week about the Hasidim and their influence on Yiddish, their influence on the democratic character of the Jewish people. But at this point, I want to say that Hasidism was not only a religious movement. It was a movement of tremendous literary importance because it brought into Yiddish a respectability and a force which the scholars had denied it till then. The Baal Shem brought to the masses not only religion, he brought them the self-respect of their own language and we can date the literary respectability of Yiddish, although it took quite a deal of time to come into its own, from the day when the Hasidim began to use it for their teachings toward the masses. Now, this is as far as I will go in this evening's lecture, and if there are any questions concerning this period, I'll be glad to entertain them now. Yes. Yes, the word is Can you hear me without the...
Do you know that? 
Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.